The Witch of Blackbird Pond, Chapter 3 Along with her pretty shoes, Kit's spirits sank lower at each step. She had clutched at a hope that the dark fringe of dripping trees might somehow be concealing the town she had anticipated. But as they plodded along the dirt road, past wide, stumpy fields, her last hopes died. There was no fine town of Weathersfield. There was a mere settlement, far more lonely and dreary than Saybrook. A man in a leather coat and breeches led a cow along the road. He stopped to stare at them, and even the cow looked astonished. Captain Eaton took advantage of the meeting to ask directions. High Street, the man said, pointing his jagged stick. Matthew Wood's place is the third house beyond the common. High Street, indeed, no more than a cow path. Kit's shoes were wet through, and the soaked ruffles of her gown slapped against her ankles. She would naturally have lifted her skirts free of the uncut grass, but a new self-consciousness restrained her. She was aware at every step of the young man who strode behind her with a trunk balanced easily on each shoulder. She relaxed slightly at the first glimpse of her uncle's house. At least it looked solid and respectable compared to the cabins they had passed. Two and a half stories it stood, gracefully proportioned, with leaded glass windows and clapboards weathered to a silvery gray. The captain lifted the iron knocker and let it fall with a thud that echoed in the pit of the girl's stomach. For a moment she could not breathe at all. Then the door opened and a thin, gray-haired woman stood on the threshold. She was quite plainly a servant, and Kit was impatient when the captain removed his hat and spoke with courtesy. Do I have the honor of addressing? The woman did not even hear him. Her look had flashed past to the girl who stood just behind, and her face had suddenly gone white. One hand reached to clutch the doorpost. Margaret! The word was no more than a whisper. For a moment the two women stared at each other. Then realization swept over Kit. No, Aunt Rachel, she cried. Don't look like that. It is Kit. I am Margaret's daughter. Kit? You mean, can it possibly be Catherine Tyler? For a moment I thought, oh, my dear child, how wonderful. All at once such a warmth and happiness swept over her pale face that Kit, too, was startled. Yes, this strange woman was indeed Aunt Rachel, and once a long time ago she must have been very beautiful. Captain Eaton cleared his throat. Well, he observed, I am relieved that this has turned out well after all. What will you have me do with the baggage, ma'am? Rachel Wood's eyes focused for the first time on the three trunk bearers. Goodness, she gasped, do all these belong to you, child? You can just set them there, I suppose, and I'll ask my husband about them. Can I offer you and your men some breakfast, sir? Thank you, we can't spare any more time. Good day, young lady. I'll tell my wife I saw you safely here. I'm sorry to have caused you trouble, Kit said sincerely, and I do thank you, all of you. Two of the three sailors had already started back along the road, but Nat still stood beside the trunks and looked down at her. As their eyes met, something flashed between them, a question that was suddenly weighted with regret. But the instant was gone before she could grasp it, and the mocking light had sprung again into his eyes. Remember, he said softly, only the guilty ones stay afloat and then he was gone. The doorway of Matthew Wood's house led into a shallow hallway from which a narrow flight of stairs climbed steeply. Through a second door, Kit stepped into the welcome of the great kitchen. In a fireplace that filled half one side of the room, a bright fire crackled, throwing glancing patterns of light 
on creamy plaster walls. There was a gleam of rubbed wood and burnished pewter. Matthew, girls, cried her aunt. Something wonderful has happened. Here is Catherine Tyler, my sister Margaret's girl, come all the way from Barbados. Three people stared up at her from the plain board table. Then from his place at the head, a man unfolded his tall, angular body and came toward her. You are welcome, Catherine, he said gravely and took her hand in his bony fingers. She could not read the faintest sign of welcome in his thin, stern lips, or in the dark eyes that glowered fiercely at her from under heavy, grizzled eyebrows. Behind him, a girl sprang up from the table and came forward. This is your cousin Judith, her aunt said, and Kit gasped with pleasure. Judith's face fulfilled in every exquisite detail the picture she had treasured of her imagined aunt. The clear white skin, the blue eyes under a dark fringe of lashes, the black hair that curled against her shoulders, and the haughty lift of her perfect small chin. This girl could have been the toast of a regiment. And your other cousin, Mercy. The second girl had risen more slowly, and at Kit first Kit was only aware of the most extraordinary eyes she had ever seen, gray as rain at sea, wide and clear and filled with light. Then, as Mercy stepped forward, one shoulder dipped and jerked back grotesquely, and Kit realized that she leaned on crutches. How lovely, breathed Mercy, her voice as arresting as her eyes, to see you after all these years, Catherine. Will you call me Kit? The question sounded abrupt. Kit had been her grandfather's name for her, and something in Mercy's smile had reached straight across the gulf, so that suddenly she wanted to hear the name spoken again. Have you had breakfast? I guess not. I hadn't even thought of it. Then tis lucky we're eating late this morning said her aunt. Take her cloak, Judith. Come close to the fire, my dear. Your skirt is soaking. As Kit threw back the woolen cloak, Judith's reaching hand fell back. My goodness, she claimed. You wore a dress like that to travel in? In her eagerness to make a good impression, Kit had selected this dress with care. But here in this plain room, it seemed over-elegant. The three other women were all wearing some nondescript sort of coarse gray stuff. Judith laid the cloak thoughtfully on a bench and reached to touch Kit's glove. What beautiful embroidery, she said admiringly. Do you like them? I'll give you some just like them if you like. I have several pairs in my trunk. Judith's eyes narrowed. Rachel Wood was setting out a pewter mug and spoon and a crude wooden plate. Sit here, Catherine, where the fire will warm your back. Tell us how you happened to come so far. Did your grandfather come with you? My grandfather died four months ago, Kit explained. Why, you poor child, all alone there on that island? Who did come with you then? I came alone. Praise be, her aunt marveled. Well, you're here safe and sound. Have some cornbread, my dear. T'was baked fresh yesterday, and there is new butter. Surprisingly, the bread tasted delicious, though of a coarse texture like nothing she had ever tasted before. Kit lifted the pewter mug thirstily and abruptly set it down. Is that water? she asked politely. Of course, drawn fresh from the spring this morning. Water? For breakfast? But the cornbread was good, and she managed a second piece in spite of her dry tongue. Rachel Wood could not seem to look away from the young face across the table, and every few moments her eyes brimmed over with tears. I declare, you look so like her, it takes my breath away. But all the same, 
There is a hint of your father there, too. I can see it if I look closely. You remember my father? Kit asked eagerly. I remember him well. A fine, upstanding lad he was, and I never could play Margaret. But it broke my heart to have her go so far. But Rachel had come even farther. What could she have seen in that fierce, silent man to draw her away from England? Could he have been handsome? Perhaps with that strong, regal nose and high forehead, but so terrifying. Matthew Wood had not sat down at the table with the others. Though he had said nothing, Kit had been aware that not a motion had escaped his intense scowl. Now he pulled down a leather jacket from a peg on the wall and thrust his long arms into the sleeves. I'll be working in the South Meadow, he told his wife. You had best not expect me till sundown. At the open door, however, he stopped and looked back at them. What is all this? he inquired coldly. Oh, said Kit, scrambling to her feet. I forgot. Those are my trunks. Yours? Seven trunks? What can be in them? Why, my clothes, and a few things of grandfather's. Seven trunks of clothes? All the way from Barbados, just for a visit? The cold, measured words fell like so many stones into the quiet room. Kit's throat was so dry, she longed now to swallow the water. She lifted her chin and looked directly into those searching eyes. I have not come for a visit, sir, she answered. I have come to stay with you. There was a little gasp from Rachel. Matthew Wood closed the door deliberately and came back toward the table. Why did you not write to us first? All her life, whenever her grandfather had asked her a question, he had expected a direct answer. Now in this stern man facing her, so, so totally different from her grandfather, Kit sensed the same quality of directness, and out of an instinctive respect, she gave the only honest answer she could. I did not dare to write, she said. I was afraid that you might not tell me to come, and I had to come. Rachel leaned forward to put a hand on Kit's arm. We would not have refused you if you were in need, said her uncle, but a step like this should not be taken without due pondering. Matthew, protested Rachel timidly, what is there to ponder? We are the only family she has. Let us talk about it later. Now Catherine is tired, and your work has been delayed already. Matthew Wood drew up a chair and sat down heavily. The work will have to wait, he said. It is best that we understand this matter at once. How did you come to set sail all alone? There was a ship in the harbor, and they said it was from Connecticut. I should have sent a letter, I know, but it might have been months before another ship came. So instead of writing, I decided to come myself. You mean that, just on an impulse, you left your rightful home and sailed halfway across the world? No, it was not an impulse, exactly. You see, I really had no home to leave. What of your grandfather's estate? I always understood he was a wealthy man. I suppose he was wealthy once, but he had not been well for a long time. I think for years he was not able to manage the plantation, but no one realized it. He left everything more and more to the overseer, a man named Bryant. Last winter, Bryant sold off the whole crop and then disappeared. Probably he sailed back to England on the trading ship. Grandfather couldn't believe it. After that, he was never really well. The other plantation owners were his friends. Nobody ever pressed him. But after he died, there just seemed to be debts everywhere, wherever I turn. Did you pay them? Yes, every one of them. All the land had to be sold, and the house, and the slaves, and all the furniture from England. There wasn't anything left, not even enough for my passage. 
to pay my way on the ship, I had to sell my own Negro girl. Huh! With one syllable, Matthew disposed of the sacrifice, only a little less sharp than grandfather's loss, of the little African slave who had been her shadow for twelve years. There was an awkward silence. Kit found Mercy's eyes and was steadied by the quiet sympathy she saw there. Then her aunt came to put an arm across her shoulder. Poor Catherine, it must have been terrible for you. You were perfectly right to come to us. You do believe she was right, don't you, Matthew? Yes, her husband conceded harshly. She was right, I suppose, since we are her only kin. I will bring in the baggage. At the door, he turned again. Your grandfather was a king's man, I reckon. He was a royalist, sir. Here in America, are you not also subjects of King James? Without answering, Matthew Wood left the room. Seven times he returned, bending his tall frame to enter the doorway and with wordless disapproval, set down one after the other the seven small trunks. They filled one entire end of the room. Where on earth can we put them? quavered her aunt. I will find a place for them later in the attic, said her husband. Seven trunks! The whole town will be talking about it before nightfall.